Hi, and welcome to thegunblog.ca. I am Nicholas Johnson. Beretta Group, Beretta Holding Group, is one of the world's largest gun companies. My guest today is Spiros Chrysohu, who is in charge of the company's Canadian operations as general manager of Stoger Canada. Hi, Spiros. Welcome. Hi, Nicholas. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm glad to be here. Now, before we get into our conversation about the company, the products, the strategy, and all sorts of, uh, of interesting topics, I wanted to communicate to everyone the economic and industrial significance of Beretta Holding Group and of your role. So, although Beretta can trace its roots to the 1500s and the Beretta family in Italy, today the corporate holding company owns some of the world's most iconic and prestigious firearm and optics brands, including... Beretta, Benelli, Frankie, Sacco, Tica, Chapuis Alm, Stoger, Steiner, Buris. You see them up there on screen. With sales last year of 810 million euros or almost 1 billion US dollars, Beretta Holding Group is in the top tier of gun companies worldwide. It's one of the biggest actors in the Canadian firearm industry where it operates is Stoger Canada and manages imports from factories around the world, distribution to gun stores across the country, and advertising to customers. And you, Spiros, you've been general manager of the company since March of 2014. You've visited the most factories around the world from the most advanced computer-controlled factories to the most ancient artisanal craft workshops. You have traveled around the world as a hunter. You've hunted around uh, around the world. And before that, you were in charge of hunting education at the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. I'm really excited to have you here. Well, thank you. Thank you. What did I miss in my high-level overview of, uh, of Beretta Holding Group and the company in Canada? Well, I mean, the, the Beretta Group, as you, you sort of uh, imply, is, is very diverse and uh, and and unique. Uh, the, the the whole business model is is very rare. I mean, we're into 17 generations now of uh, of a Beretta uh, owning and operating the company, and so that's that in itself is unique, and it and it transcends a culture to all the companies. And we're, we're many companies. You, you sort of mentioned the factory, some of the factories, and there are, there are even more. Um, some are specialized into military and other, other areas. But, uh, you know, we're, we're in, you know, 20 countries around the world, and, and it, it is quite unique. As, as, we, as we see the being privately owned, the name and the company becomes, you know, critical. You know, the, the Beretta family is always very concerned about what they put their name on, who they're associated with, and what they're doing. And so, so we, we, we're not always chasing that bottom line. We're, we're chasing, you know, the credibility and the reputation. And the Berettas, by generation, are obliged to a legacy that, that continues through. And it gives us the autonomy in each country to be able to to operate it with that same culture, that same integrity, all, all the way down. So we're we're pretty excited about that. So, and that probably can't be overstated. I used to work as a financial journalist, and the 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 cliche, right, is that they're not running a company for generations down the road. They're running it for the late for the next quarterly results. You're you're immune from that type of consideration. You does that? How does that affect the way you run the business? Well, it's it's actually uh, you know uh, the, the big part of it because you know because of like like I sort of mentioned you know what we're doing it's not we don't think in one year five year or ten year terms you know we, wow. we're looking at it from a generational perspective and so you know it, it could be unique as some of the when, when in in how we built our facility and some of the features we have where if you were thinking in the even the 10 to 20 year term, you may not have done it. But when you think in 100 year terms, all of a sudden you're, you're willing to make that investment. And so it's, it's really important to, to, to who we are and, and, uh, and, and how, we, how we engage with our customers, how we engage with our, our, our own staff uh, and, and integrate with our other companies around the world. Another thing that I think is really interesting and why I'm, I'm really interested to have you here is that although, I, so I'm a, I'm a I'm a gun owner, I'm a shooter. I know the brands 
most of the brands that, 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 you know, all the brands that I listed, but I don't know much about the company because you operate as B2B, business to business, as the, the importer distributor. We don't, that's, that's more um, behind the scenes from what the end user sees. So I'm, I'm really uh, happy to have you here to take us behind the scenes. Sure, sure. And, and you know, and that's, that's a, a great point because, you know, Stoger Canada in itself, you know, is our trade name within Canada with, since 1976. And so, you know, each brand stands on its own merit. And that's, that's really what the, the customer, the consumer, the end user needs to see and, and appreciate. You know, we, we love to see when, you know, for instance, the Benelli, we always, you know, reference uh, sometimes the Benelli owner is a bit of a cult ownership where they, they love Benelli's and only Benelli's. And, and so, you know, when, you know, we as a company appreciate it and support that kind of thinking, you know, uh, even though they're part of the group. And that's that's top down where, you know, one could look at if we were a shareholder type company that there would be a lot of redundancies that you would want to eliminate. And because we're privately owned, they they enjoy and encourage some of those redundancies because it keeps the companies innovative, stops them from blending everything into sort of one sort of look and feel. It, it keeps the, the, the differences within the brands and, and keeps them fighting for their own market share. And it's and it's pretty exciting from the inside watching it because, you know, we're certainly because all the factories are coming to us and, and trying to gain our attention as well. And, and so we could we could then bring that to the consumer. And so it's uh, it's pretty exciting to see it's uh, an, an experience. So we're going to have a problem here because you've already said a bunch of stuff that I want to follow up on. And I have a, I've got pages, a couple of pages of questions here. But um, I want to just zoom in on something you said here. The the I, I, the loyalty to the Benelli brand is that that's really interesting because I would have assumed that you have the, the, the fanboys or the cult following for any brand in the world, not only brands of your group. Is 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 there something special about the Benelli user? Well, yeah, the Benelli. I mean, they they came later to the to the game, if you want to say. I mean, the you know Benelli's history, you know, started in motorcycles. They were building race motorcycles and and premium scooters and in in Italy and and in in Europe. And so the brothers that were owning and running Benelli at the time liked to shoot, and they were very innovative and creative, and they started building this inertia gun and and they and they thought it was really unique and so what we've what we've seen is the the followers of the Benelli brand really uh, have uh, cling to that and and that thinking so Benelli is very much about innovation about their creativity and about finding ways to 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 maintain their market now their product lines are much narrower than let's say a Beretta um, but they found a niche within it. And certainly when Beretta was looking, you know, with, with their great gas guns, they, we thought they, they realized that Benelli has become a real competitor for them. And so like many things, you've got your choice. Do you, do you, do you reinvent the wheel to compete with them or do you buy them and bring them under the umbrella and let them compete with you, but all, you know, inside the umbrella. And so that's, that's how they've chosen. And that's, that's just to, to digress for a second, you know, part of Beretta's model is, you know, when we, when we look at those brands, they, they don't buy brands as, as an investment. They buy brands as, as uh, to fit into a portfolio. And so each brand represents a space in a portfolio that's very important to them. And by, by bringing them in, being able to apply expertise in production, production efficiencies, quality, quality control, engineering, uh, and R&D to create a product that that's not driving cost up, in some cases bringing it down, but more importantly, improving a product, improving its uh, production and its the capacity of the factory, and then applying a global, uh, a global network of distribution. Uh, for it, and so so where the companies can really excel, uh, it's it's pretty exciting to see their transitions. Is that different from any other brand within the Beretta Holding Group or any other gun company in the world? It it sounds like well, this. It sounds like you're trying to say that this Benelli is is in some way unique. 
in wanting to improve and innovate and limit costs and and but is well, that it, really so, unique? Yeah, so it's so two tiered on on that on that on that sort of in the conversation because um, one from Beretta's model within the group, they've applied that to all the group brands. So every time they they look at examine a a company for acquisition, it has to fit. A certain model for them. It, it has to have room. It has to have good brand, good people, and room to really apply those 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 things to. Benelli itself, uh, you know, is certainly a top tier brand, and you know their culture. When you think of uh, where they're located, if to to be able to go to Benelli, it's in Urbino. Which is a UNESCO site. The whole the whole town is 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 a is a heritage site. There, the factory cannot expand. It's it's maxed out on its footprint in the region because the whole region is is a sensitive uh, region uh, in that in that aspect. So, how do they increase capacity? Is by you know increasing R and D and efficiencies within it. And so, when you walk into the Benelli factory. Um, it's it's very much you know everybody's wearing lab coats everybody's you know uh, really a technician of sort the robotics the the computerization and and uh, the efficiencies within it are, are are much higher than many factories outside the group um, and even certainly inside the group as well uh, and it's something they've evolved to to be able to make their improvements and and satisfy global capacity or needs for capacity so it's uh it's quite quite unique in in that sense it's it's fascinating okay i i want to i just want to i want to come back to this stuff but there's <laughs> sure. so much i want to, I'm, I'm an ambitious guy right there's so much i want to cover uh, today with with you we don't have we don't have all day but you're you're getting me to the to think that we really could do a deep dive on every single one of the brands has a has an incredible story an incredible history and and hopefully an incredible future um, yeah i know <laughs> I, I, I want to switch to just change tracks here to the we're coming to the end of 2021 we're recording this on the 14th of december 2021 and right now i want like a little bit of a year in review how was this year for you guys in canada Geez, where to where to start? I mean, I guess in in a word, uh, you could say fantastic. Um, you know, certainly being sensitive to the global pandemic and and a, you know a lot of the you know the the, the sickness, if you want to say, and and uh, that people have gone through. But from our industry and certainly from Stoker Canada or and the Beretta Group's perspective, it was a fantastic year sales wise. Uh, we came into 2021. Well, let's if we go back a year in 2020. In 2020, it was a fantastic year, um, driven by unfortunate circumstances. One being COVID coming in and the fears around COVID. We had uh, fears of gun bans. Politics were 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 really threatening and, and looming over our heads as a black cloud. Uh, the order and council came out. So there was a drive to to purchase uh, guns. Things were locking down. People had nothing else to do. Certainly, global unrest in the U.S. Um, drove U.S. tactical sales, which in turn started driving Canadian tactical sales. And so, 2020 was was certainly a terrific year as far as sales went. Looking at 2021, we thought, well, there's no way to replicate that. Uh, you know, things are going to settle. You know, this pandemic can't last. And uh, here we are. Uh, we were wrong. And 2021 was even more outstanding than 2020 was. Uh, and and driven still uh, somewhat along the same rationale. But I think the big one for us in Canada, well, tactical sales are up and and tactical sales in Canada are a smaller percentage of the overall sales. And so when they're when they fluctuate, um, you, you can see as a percentage, they move quicker and easier. Uh, and, and so we've so we've seen that uh, and they, they've done really well. Um, what do you hunting, call what do you call tactical sales? Well, is, that, is that police and military? 
well, well, uh -huh. not going into police and military, but in, uh -huh. in if we want to talk about the tactical guns, you know, the Benelli M4s, uh, the, the supernova tacticals, and, and handguns as well would, would get put into that as well. Okay. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., they'd call it home defense. <laughs> you, know, you know, we just call it, uh, you know, tactical and, and or tactical in some cases, uh, certainly. But hunting is still the core of the Canadian hunting and and sport shooting is the core of the Canadian market. And so we saw a great increase in 21 because the ranges were open for the full year. And so in, in sporting competition shooting, precision shooting on rifles uh, and target, but also clay targets as well. Uh, hunting, uh, it was great to see a lot of laps hunters come back uh, and get back into hunting. People couldn't travel, so they were they took advantage of the outdoors and and went out and and uh, you know were whether they were shooting you know rabbits or or up to big game, uh, they they certainly indulged and it's and and we saw that uh, we saw that enjoyment of the the outdoors and uh, it was really really something great to see long term. Uh, again, you know we 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 talked earlier we don't. We don't work on short term. It's nice to have some spikes here and there, but we like we like the the long term game. And the more people that hunt, the more people that shoot uh, competitively, uh, recreationally, the 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 more people in the outdoors, in the industry, uh, and involved. And and uh, and that's what feeds feeds the long term game for us. So. Let's dig in a little deeper. What uh, what were some of your hot sellers of this year? <laughs> where where does you know where to start? <laughs> I mean, because they all spiked. Uh, I mean, certainly if we looked at sort of the the black gun tactical side, I mean, there was the you know the the, the Tika the Tac A one as in a in a bolt rifle, uh, the the Benelli M four, uh, which is sort of the, if you want to say, the top of the food chain in shotguns, especially tactical shotguns, because it's being unique where it wasn't a hunting gun that got, you know, painted black and turned into a tactical gun with accessories. It was a gun designed for the law enforcement and military, and, and that that is able to be used, uh, you know, for, for, you know, recreational sport shooting as well too so it's it's uh it's done really well the pump actions uh did well again talking the tactical side overall though uh you know the Sako and tika especially tika i would say in the hunting rifles exploded this year as far as uh the, the demand for it uh, you know the factory has produced more than they ever have uh, and are have been adding you know, labor force running around the clock trying to keep up to global demand, but certainly Canadian demand is, is certainly a, a big part of it. Uh, we're, we're, you know, Canada is a unique uh, country when you step back, because within Canada, we're bogged down by a lot of legislation, regulation, and, and, and pressures uh, against, you know, firearms. Uh, globally, though, we're still one of the main players. Uh, you know, of course, we exclude the U.S. because that's half the world <laughs> as far as uh, its its demands. But Canada's pretty well number two, uh, right behind it. So uh, it's done really well. And when you say that, is that um, Canada's number two, right behind the U.S. for Beretta Holding Group as a whole? Yeah, pretty. Yeah, it's safe to say. And 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 I would I would say in in guns in general. You know, there there'll be specific guns, specific action types that might, uh, you know, have a have a, an increase in other countries. But but when we look at guns in general, Canada um, is very much uh, about gun ownership. The the amount of guns an individual owns is is high. The amount of guns an individual desires to own is high. Uh, we don't have those restrictions where in some countries. Uh, in, Europe, they they'll restrict them to three guns only, and you know, and so, and that's where the modular type guns of uh, barrel change, caliber changes are very popular because then they count as one gun with a lot of different calibers. I I typically find that in Canada, and and I'm I'm certainly guilty of it, the preference 
you know, I could buy even a shotgun with two different barrels, but at the at the end of the day, I'd rather have two shotguns than one with two barrels, and and that's that's what we see in Canada as as a culture and and really as industry, we appreciate it. Uh, and and like I said, I'm guilty of that personally. <laughs> it's it's so interesting. You didn't. I don't know if you're done your, your rundown of the hot products, but you didn't mention the Super Black Eagle Three, which when, when I, I visited the um, I visited. The room you're in right now uh, a few years ago i'm just going to put up a screenshot of that here by the way we're recording this live i'm uh, we're not doing what a lot of people do which is post recording editing we're, we're doing this on the fly here i'm controlling i'm, I'm my own production team I, I visited your offices in oshawa ontario uh, in 27 in 2017 and um and at the time one of the big stars was the super black eagle 3 i'm just going to get a photo of that up uh which is hugely popular i learned at the time hugely popular with duck hunters and you haven't mentioned it or you haven't mentioned it yet i haven't mentioned it yet i haven't mentioned it yet i was moving moving across yeah no the the super black eagle three uh you know and again that's that's the the, the benelli you know fan club for sure uh is you know the super black eagle two well the the one then the two and now the three is is completely taking over in that hunting the and it's it's very uh special in the real appreciation comes in to those who hunt hard the avid hunters uh are the ones who really uh take to it because it is the workhorse uh it you can't stop it uh, and you know, when you spend a lot of time in the field, whether it's waterfowl or other, it's, uh, you, you learn to really appreciate what it does, uh, how it feels and how it shoots. So, so it's, it's done exceptional, uh, certainly this year, as well as its main competitor, the A400, <laughs> you know, the Beretta, uh, they always go head to head and, and, and people argue about them and, uh, you know, you sort of laugh. Of course, you know, I, People always ask me and, you know, and it's, it's, you know, I'll, I'll give you an exclusive for sure right here, which, which one, the A400 or the Super Black Eagle. And, and so, you know, the question's always, which one should I buy? Which one is better? And so the answer uh, comes down to which one fits you better. <laughs> so, cause there isn't any, there isn't the, both of them are, 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 are outstanding guns and will, will serve you. Uh, for life uh, without any problem, but at the end of the day, they fit differently. And uh, so I always, I always say, you get, you have to pick them up and shoulder them, and one will feel better than the other to you. You know, some, you know, they just the, the configuration's a little different, the balance is a little different, and there is there is a preference that people may not know, but until they pick it up, uh, you know, that's when they find out. So. And is that something you can detect and notice with your, your body geometry and fit and so forth? Is that something you can pick up in a, in a store showroom? Or is that something you need to fire a, a bunch of rounds through each one and you'll only find out after you've you, fired a bunch of rounds? Yeah, no, you could pick it up right in the store. You'll, you'll be able to feel the difference. Really? Okay. Yeah, it's, you know, the, the Benelli's uh, and this, especially the Super Black Eagle, they've made it a little lighter. It's slimmer profile, you know, the, the foreign's a little slimmer, very, you know, Benelli spends a lot of time on ergonomics. So there's not a lot of excess anywhere. The, 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 the pistol grip, if you want to say, is slimmer and pulled back a little more versus the Beretta. Uh, the A400, I, I would compare it almost typically fitting a little more like an over under. Uh, and so uh, a, a little, the, the pistol grip, some would argue, is a little more forgiving because it's a little bigger, uh, but it, it's got a different balance, different feel, and and really, in a showroom, in a store, you can you can truly pick it up and feel the difference. Uh, and 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 typically, you're going to have a preference at that point, but you got to pick them both up. That's that's the thing, right? It's because uh, both of them are going to feel great, and then if when you put the two in comparison, that's when you you will see and feel a preference to one. So. It's so interesting. Yeah. And do you have, as, as the group, do you have your, your star either by dollar value or by volume, yeah, number of number of sales that that is your, I don't know, your top three or your standout? Yeah, I mean, we we track all that. I mean, that's not, 
we, we don't give that out because, you know, we don't, I don't want to sway that, uh, sway people's opinions based on that. I mean, the, the market falls where the market falls. Certainly, you know, units and price point always have uh, varying degrees. For instance, the Stoger, uh, you know, 3500s uh, are, are a great gun uh, at a great price point and where you might see more units going out in those versus, let's say, the Benelli Super Black Eagle 3. The dollars are, are quite different. Because right. uh, the Black Eagle Three is around twenty five hundred, is that right? Yeah, just uh, twenty five retail would be about twenty five, twenty six hundred there, you right. know, in, in thereabouts. So, you know, we're we're so you're, you know, almost more than double the price of, for instance, the Stoger, which is a great gun, and for for you know a, a good uh, uh, you know a hunter who who hunts a good amount of time uh, certainly would would appreciate it and and have. You know, no regrets at all. Um, but again, it's, you know, where do you want to go with it, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, people have often, you know, compared, you know, you know, why would I buy a Beretta or a Benelli over some of the competitors? And, and you know, they, really it's a question of they're all good. I mean, really today, you know, any of the, you know, the name brands anyway that they're out there, they're all good guns and, and you know, and, and good products. It's it's what takes it to the next level. You know, it's almost, you know, you could you can say, you know, a, a, a GM is a is a great car. There's nothing wrong with the GM. They're good. They're solid. They work. They're affordable. Um, but a Maserati has a little more to offer in the details. Right. In the engineering. Right. And, and so it really starts becoming those kinds of comparisons where, you know, there's nothing wrong with with, you know, not that I want to pick on GM, like, you know, a Dodge, a GM, a Ford, you know, any of those pick one, any, you know, could Toyota could be, a, you know, a, a Nissan doesn't matter. But then you, you compare Maseratis and Ferraris and, and such and you're going, well, yeah, they're both great vehicles. They both take you from A to B. But one takes you there a little differently than the other, and and we see that with guns too. I mean, the the difference in how they perform, how they shoot, recoil management, um, reliability is is what starts making the difference down the road. And and so, I mean, when we look at the Tikas and the Sakos, it's it's nothing new. For years, they've been shooting, you know, minute or sub minute groups out of the box, and. And we see that all the time. Uh, certainly, I mean, it's guaranteed. But even even when we transcend to law enforcement, and and they really start looking at it from where where accuracy and reliability is everything, um, you know, the 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 Tika blue synthetic out of the box will 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 compete with any of the the sniper rifles that are out there globally. And you know, when you're when you're downrange, you know, it's uh, so. So it's it's fantastic in that way to to see. Yeah. It's also I want to pick up on this before we come back. I want to come back to some Canada stuff. But how do you uh, how do you advise people or when you're making a distinction? I'm going to play with the Maserati GM uh, Toyota thing. If I'm going into the backcountry, I would much rather have a GM or a Toyota than a Maserati, right? You want reliable. You want you're going to turn the key. It's going to start. And likewise, if you're going halfway across the country or you're going to make a, a critical shot in your in your police, military, hunting, whatever application you have, you want to make sure that that shot happens the way you want it to. How do you make a decision between the computer engineered $1,200 Tika versus the 30 or, I don't know, $100,000 craftsman art piece of art shotgun? How do you put all that into, into like, how do you weigh all that? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a great point because... You know the the one the one thing to that you know we keep in mind is that the hundred thousand dollar gun is the same as let's say let's say if we're talking over a bread over unders and I mean we can go a hundred we can go two hundred we can go half a million dollar gun it's really the same as the two thousand dollar gun the difference is in the detail of the wood the engraving the, the maybe the hand tuning the polishing. Um, it doesn't affect reliability. It's not where it becomes more temperamental. If you take that hundred thousand dollar gun into the backwoods and, and and into rough country, say where it's going to be less reliable, you may get some scratches on it, 
and it may cost you more if you're going to repair those scratches or if you don't just appreciate them as character. Um, but functionality is going to be the same. And so really, and you know, the, the one thing, you know, we say is when whatever price the gun is and whether you, you get up over into six figures or, or higher, um, the guns are made to shoot and they're, they're made to hunt, they're made to shoot. And so, you know, we don't make guns as showpieces. Every gun is made to, to be able to be used in the field, shot with perfect reliability. So, so there isn't, you know, I mean, I, I would always tell people in anything I've learned, you know, in my own years of, you know, buy the best you can, the most you can afford, stretch a little. Uh, it's a lot cheaper than, than trying to work your way up on, in a bunch of levels. You know, if you could skip levels, it's a lot cheaper in the end. Um, but but the, the, our guns are made for using. Um, you know, it's not, it's, you know, I've, I've seen, I've hunted with guys that, I mean, you know, you're, you're looking at their guns going, you know, I could buy a house with that. Right. <laughs> but, but they're, but yeah, you know, well, a little harder how, nowadays in Toronto. How anyway. many, <laughs> how many, uh, house price guns do you sell? How many half a million dollar guns do you sell in Canada a year? Well, in there, so in, in typically when we're getting up into the big price points, there are. The factories are involved and we're bringing customer and factory together because it's, you know, at that point you're not off the shelf. Uh, you know, it's, there's very much uh, customizing, engraving, what kind of engraving, you know, we've, we've had, uh, you know, within in gold coat of arms for families uh, put engraved into the wood and with gold inlay and such. So, so the factories are very involved. So they're not, we don't count that as uh, going out the door from Stoker Canada per se, where it's, it's really, it's, it's part of the family brand that we bring, we bring people and product together. The, I should just as a sidebar mention that we did ex exclude which one of our newest purchases, which sort of falls in line with when we're talking about price point is Holland and Holland. So Holland and Holland was uh, the latest purchase uh, from the Beretta group. And so that uh, was just recently done uh, in 21. And it's a great addition to the group. Uh, you know, we know Holland and Holland, certainly of the classic calibers, 375 H&H &H and, and such, but certainly they're, they're double guns, uh, you know, Rain King, uh, you know, the, well, Rain King and even the Queen shoots them. So, or, or did anyway, Prince Charles certainly does, but, so they're, they're a classic uh, English gun. Uh, again, the, the pinnacle of, of double guns uh, globally, really, and from the English perspective. And that was a, a, a joint sort of desire to come part of the Beretta group because they were currently owned by uh, uh, a designer uh, you know, a clothing designer brand. And so that didn't necessarily understand who they are, what they are. And it was just, you know, Holland Holland was the, the top of the gun, you know, sort of haute couture, if you want to say. And so that fell in line with the designer brand. And so by it becoming part of the Beretta group, uh, was certainly uh, in, enthusiastically received from Holland and Holland because now being part of a gun company that invests into into gun companies into new acquisitions and doesn't strip from new acquisitions and so so it's pretty exciting we're looking forward to uh bringing more into canada and getting more involved with with even that brand and again you know those you know you're 200 grand plus uh for when you can start getting into those now so it's uh and just to provide an extra context i'm i'm uh, the the 375 Holland and Holland is, or at least certainly was, it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was the African safari gun. Yeah, it's, it's like the, the benchmark. Yeah, 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 for sure. And it's still really the minimum caliber that you could use for dangerous game. Uh, I was fortunate uh, a few months ago to get my Cape Buffalo with the 375. <laughs> so H&H, &H, so uh, performs great, uh, great caliber, great shooting. I, I still know guys that use it on moose uh, and such here. I mean, uh, it's it's a, it's a great caliber. So, but uh, but yeah, the brand is certainly a welcome uh, brand for us. And also, there in uh, Holland, Holland also owns a shooting facility 
premier shooting facility in in the London area as well. So that's also part of the group too. So mm. looking forward to being there in the spring. So we can do a recap. <laughs> love, love to, love to. The bouncing back to Canada in those. So so you sell a, a, a small number of very expensive uh, custom made firearms. Can you give a number of the total number of firearms you guys sell each year in Canada? Um, I mean, it's it's definitely in the, the the tens of thousands. I mean, if uh, it's 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 over fifty anyway. Um, let's let's say that uh, the the one thing uh, actually we hit a milestone this year as a Beretta group. Just to to sidetrack, where we've sold uh, as a group over a million firearms this year. To give this you an year. idea, yeah, this year. That's so as, congratulations. Uh, so it's been, yeah, it's, it's an, an exceptional achievement for uh, certainly the, the patriarch, uh, Cavalieri Ugo uh, Gusali Barreda. Uh, it was always a mark he wanted to hit. Uh, and uh, he's, he's stepped down, if you want to say, as, as, the, as the head, but uh, his sons are, are leading that charge. And under their tutelage, uh, we've hit a mil the million, the million gun in one year mark. So that's a great achievement. We're quite happy with that. Well, con congratulations to to you and your and your colleagues. When you um, when you're deciding on the Canadian market, are there how do you decide between which models you will bring in, which new models, and which models you don't want to bring in? Yeah, it's it's um, it's an interesting approach. Uh, I mean, certainly the the government and the RCMP uh, help guide us in that because they tell us what we can't bring in, even if we want to. Um, but we really look at the trends um, that within our product group, uh, we'll look at overall trends as well, but we'll look at the trends within our product group. And we, we've we learned to understand what is our core. And with that, we will bring in, if you want to say samplings or smaller numbers of, of some of the other ones to test the market, see what the reception is like. And, and so where we see an uptake in it, we can then increase and, and grow from there. So it's, uh, you know, for the most part, we try and bring in as much as we can, but obviously we don't want to spread too thin and, and have too much of something that the demand isn't there for. We want to make sure we always meet the demands of the core. But it's, it's really playing with the market. And we have, you know, the great thing is we have that flexibility. So, you know, whether we want to bring in 550 or 5,000, to test uh, what the, the market uptake is. And in some cases, we'll even do, as, as you mentioned in the beginning, we're B2B, so we'll work with our dealer network in some cases. And if you want to say pre-sell or pre-offer and, and go to them with, hey, here's some options. Are, are these of any interest? Are your customers asking? We're ready to bring them in, either a finite number or in, in you know, indefinite or a non-specific number and just keep ringing. Uh, so, so we'll play with the market in, in that sense, but we'll, we'll try and, and often with, you know, where, you know, the European appreciation for some products is different than the North American one. Um, we'll, we'll often test and with, with global marketing that the companies do and the factories do, we then get feedback from consumers as to, just by by nature of question and uh, you know emails of hey are you bringing this in or watching social media our own social media uh, our factory social media and to see where where there there's interest and and what's tweaking people's uh, thoughts at that point so so let's let's look at let's zoom in on in another case study here this is another company that recently just in the past uh, this year joined the Beretta Holding Group that's the Chapuis Arme and the this is the Manurin MR73 Sport, an iconic revolver that is a 50-year-old, almost 50-year-old design. It's used by the GIGN, the, uh, the French uh, anti-terrorism, counter-terrorism unit. And, and this is, I believe, the revolver, um, the, not this one, but the, the, the model that was used in the, gosh, when was that? The hijacking. They didn't use ARs. They used a revolver to take down the, the, the hostages in an airplane hijacking. Um, something like this it's it's in Canada it's in stores I'm seeing it priced from memory around thirty five hundred dollars how do you how many 
what's been the interest in in this kind of a model? Well, that's this one is really a, a special uh, a special uh, product specifically within the Shop We Arms uh, group because uh, you know they do over unders, they do a straight pull, they do side by sides, but this specific uh, product. Uh, is is really something special. So when when Chef we became part of the group, there was already a demand for these products in country, and so so which really helped our transition because often uh, the waiting list on these could be one to two years from our a distributor standpoint to get these in. So so we were fortunate that there was already production allocated to Canada, and so when we took over and they became part of the group we then just took over all that existing uh, earmark production and so so we're kind of fortunate here that we had the products so we have them and we got them out you know like you know you, you sort of mentioned it's where it's been used and it's it's somewhat unbelievable when we see all the police forces going to semi-autos and and you know and and you know ARs and semi-autos and 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 here they're pulling out they're in a hostage rescue situation they're pulling out revolvers and really uh i mean i had to buy one of these myself and so, so it, and it's I, and it i had to get it because once you pick it up and once you shoot it there's no turning back it it shoots so well uh so smooth it makes everybody look good. <laughs> uh, the tolerances are exceptionally tight, uh, and so its reliability is 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 bar none. And so, and that's why, in those cases, to be able to to do the the draw and and to be the confidence in taking the shot, and uh, you know, in in those police and and special task force uh, requirements. I mean, once once you pick it up and shoot it, you, I mean, you just you don't look back because it it really makes it easy. I mean, I I know I go to the range personally, and I've got you know all my different semis and that. And nowadays, if if I know there's there's people around, I want to impress them. I'll just bring that, and, uh, you know, <laughs> and, you, and it makes you look good. So, uh, but no, it's a fantastic gun. It, it's uh, it's really some. And we like I said, we're fortunate that we have them in country, uh, and we have now. Uh, a steady flow that will continue to come in and and the volumes at that price point for a revolver are are very good uh very good and surprising uh you know how how steady it is uh, and can you give us an idea would you sell in a in a year more than 100 less than 100 um it would be probably a little more than that uh, okay you yeah, know given off the top of my head you know, right but uh but yeah, it's a uh, yeah. It's I always once once people touch them, you know. It's you know again goes back to that Maserati scenario where this is this is the engineering, the detail is is so is so precise. Yet you know which translates to to uh, performance. Uh, we've got a couple uh, shooters in Canada. Uh, you know. Um, Let's say Roly, uh, Miles, and uh, and Mark, um, uh, the last name just Ash, Ashcroft. It just escapes me. And nonetheless, uh, both are top uh, five. Roly is a, a top ranked world shooter, uh, competitive shooter, and uh, he he reached out to us uh, because um, a Swedish a Swedish shooter in the top ten, the world top ten. Uh, was using a Mandarin, and uh, so he reached out saying, "Hey, I want, I want, I want to learn about these. I, you know, I'm interested because he was, as a machinist, would would uh, do a lot of work uh, on his gun. Mark Horsley, sorry, is his name. I'm sure they don't mind me saying it because they're they're top ranked. If you look them up, uh, they as a team, as a as a pair, they they were number one in the world, and Roly was number one in the world, and Mark, I believe, is top five right now. And so, but but uh, you know, they were they said this was one of the only guns that would pass the the sort of the barrel test as far as the barrel chamber for straightness and such out of the box, right? And so, just gives you an idea of some of the quality. So. So we're pretty excited to have it part of the group. 
what um what percentage whoops i didn't mean to do that so i'll bring that up in a sec what percentage do, of your sales would you say are hunting um sports shooting law enforcement military in in canada How, how's the breakdown there yeah it's um i don't actually don't have it offhand um because it's very category specific too so you know um i i I know hunting would probably, well, I'd say hunting is the greater percentage. Um, sport shooting, you know, certainly follow. And then, you know, defense and law enforcement would be under that. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess you can go hunting, uh, competitive uh, sport shooting, tactical, and, and law enforcement military specific as well. That one, although fluctuates greatly based on tenders, based on what's out in the market, what's available and, and and volume of, of sales specific because because you your 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 products are used by everything from olympic athletes to weekend plinkers to military snipers to like it's uh to to i'm gonna say like a um what's like a, a duck hunter like the, the default the super black eagle three again is is very popular in that so you have the whole the whole range right right uh, i want to zoom in and now on the um on the the military contract that's underway in canada and i'm just going to put up here a slide with with some of your government uh government agencies clients the, can you tell us so the the government uh so the military has a tender out for its new handgun and I thought it was a shoe in for the Sig Sauer P320 and Glock's distributor went to the uh, Canadian International Trade Tribunal to, uh, to object to the terms and conditions of the tender offer, the, the language and, and what it said. You intervened with the distributor for Sig Sauer, MD Charlton. Which, um, where do things stand on that at the moment? Um, well, the, the tender is still, the RFP is still uh, out. It's, it hasn't been withdrawn. Uh, the, the, you know, it, when we go back, I started working personally on the, uh, uh, the pistol requirement with uh, the Department of Defense in 2009, January 2009. The January SHOT Show 2009, I had started working on that. And so, it's been a long time in coming. We've gone through probably three different, you know, options of pistols for it as the as the requirement has evolved and as the needs on the on the on the front line and and operationally have evolved. Uh, so they've moved through it. the The desire for uh, the Army Department of Defense to look for a modular pistol were really them looking forward into the future. Canada uh, is very well respected in what it chooses, what it uses uh, globally with all the global military and police. Um, it's safe to say we can be very slow in our procurement. Hence the current Browning High Power was a great pistol in its day and during World War II. <laughs> you know, those those days have come and gone now, and it's uh, it's time for a change. And it really, you know, it, as a Canadian, you know, I really look at it in in first. We got guys out there in harm's way, guys and gals uh, out in harm's way, and you know, shame of shame on us as Canadians that we ill-equip them while they're out there doing what we've asked them to do. You know, fighting for our ideology, fighting for our, our freedoms, fighting for what we believe is right, and then we ill-equip them, and and that's a big concern for me. And so, my first and primary desire is always that these 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 service people have the equipment they need. Um, the Department of Defense has, uh, through a long and tedious uh, exploration and discovery, have come up with a requirement that they want and wish in, a, in, in the pistol in this case. And so it's very future oriented. Um, they don't, you know, they, we don't know what the future holds, what the future theater will hold and and require and so they desired a a module a certain modularity or modular characteristics in a pistol that would help them transcend into that future um and so 
anything that slows that down as a Canadian, I'm offended. Uh, and that's outside of the Beretta Group and Stoger Canada. I say that as a Canadian. And so right now, uh, the, the tender is still out. It hasn't uh, been rescinded. Uh, the RFP, I should say, is still out and, uh, and available uh, for submission. And uh, we'll know in January, uh, really, what, what happens with it. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you. Which firearm are you planning to tender? Um, well, I mean, we I don't want to get into the specifics, but certainly if you looked at our our, uh, our, our assortment of, of uh, handguns, one of them would, would be, could be the Beretta APX. It's certainly uh, uh, a modular, similar to, you mentioned the SIG 320 and similar along the same line. Um, so that's certainly you know a main contender for us uh, that we would look at. So understood, and yeah, we're uh, watching that closely. We, I'm, yeah, the how how generally you, you've alluded to some of this in your comments in the since we've been speaking. How as a businessman, as a business person, do you navigate the the regulatory strictness, the the, the May 2020, May 1st, in the middle of the day, a policy change. How do you navigate that? How, how does that affect your business? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's it's virtually day to day, and and we're always expecting something, and something is always something is always looming over our heads. So it's really the the effort to track what is happening. We we really, I'd say, from our perspective make an effort to be proactive, uh, to try and get ahead of the curve, uh, to have, whether it's political meetings, uh, whether there's lobbyists out there, there's certainly in Canada, we have great, great lobby groups and, and, and member organizations, whether it is the OFH or the other conservation wildlife groups across Canada or the, you know, the CSSA. And, and there, there's many that, that are out there and, and working with them, keeping our ear uh, really on the track, talking with politicians, understanding direction, and trying to be preemptive on that and, uh, and, and seeing where there's lag times, uh, where we need to get ahead of something and where we need to deal with it. You know, our Canadian gun laws sometimes can be volatile in, you know, we saw, you know, Harper's government with some sensible approach to gun laws uh, change some of what was there, simplify it, and, and not, uh, you know, affect crime in the sense where there was an increase or anything. You know, we, we they were sensible. They, you know, respect for the law-abiding uh, person and, and, and going after criminal. You know, we've seen you know, political smoke and mirrors. We knew with this election, uh, you know, if the conservatives got in, we certainly had uh, in their intentions to sort of look back at some of Harper's, uh, you know, thinking. Uh, and it wasn't, I mean, of course, you know, I'm saying Harper, but it's certainly the parties and, and, and certainly some of the, the advocates there. And so, but I guess to the point, it's, um, it's every day you wake up, and, and 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 you wonder what's going to happen, but we just we just try and stay stay involved. We you know try and stay involved with you know politicians, bureaucrats, policymakers, uh, and and you know certainly consumers, businesses, and users too. Uh, and and so we there. We even like uh, to work uh, with our embassies. Uh, that you know being a such a diverse company of, of, of countries where we like to work with the embassies uh, to, to gather support uh, and, and insight through them as well, wherever we can. So, Because it's, it's, there's, a, there's a perception. It's, I'm very happy to hear you say that as a, as a I'll call it a gun rights advocate. I'm very happy to hear you say that because I had the perception, and I think it's broader than just me. It's a kind of a disappointment in the perception that you're you're very active. Your company is very active in promoting the products, but sometimes in the in the policy battle, 
we don't see big companies such as yours, we don't see them active, for example, in the court cases or taking out ads in the major media. So you, it's how do you respond to that? How do you make that judgment about where you want to be active, where you don't want to be active, where you want to be seen to be active and where you want to play a more behind the scenes role? How do you? Yeah, I mean, that's it's a great point. And and we are very active in the behind the scenes at a higher level um, in in supporting, let's say, the industry groups to do their to do what what they can do. Um, there's a, a lot of different groups out of there taking a lot of different approaches. And so, you know, where we can't and won't necessarily just do a, a blanket investment on all or pick one over the other because they're all doing good work and some of them in different ways. Um, really, as a, as, a, as a corporate entity that we are, we are you know, certainly supporting businesses and consumers and, and the groups to, to make their approach. We are, uh, we're working with uh, legal teams and politicians and, and bureaucrats on, on the other side to, to really sway policy from a different approach. And that you think, I'm, I'm, that you, I'm assuming the reason we don't really know about that is because you think that it works best in a closed door is private. Like you're not sending out press releases and taking out full page ads to slam this or that politician. You're, you're taking mm -hmm. a different approach. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a different approach. It, it won't do us any good. It won't do the community uh, any good if, you know, if, because we'll burn a bridge there that otherwise we have. Right. And, and we're able to, to get the ear of, of certain people. Um, because we're allowing, you know, the, the consumers, the organizations, the, the, the not-for-profits to, to really chase that, uh, and, uh, you know, from the front line. And we're trying to work at it from the back line, from political view. And, and that's where, where I mentioned even the embassies getting them involved because, you know, there's, you know, prohibitions and, and bans, if you want to say, impact global trade. And so, so there's different approaches that we're trying to work on. And, uh, and by all means, you know, because we're not doing press releases, doesn't mean we're not active and we're not supporting all those efforts because we certainly do wherever we can. Has there been, um, well, there was a proposal around Bill C-71 a couple of years ago of, uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give the short, kind of a shortcut, uh, charge an extra five bucks per gun to create a special legal fund to do some high profile court challenges or an advertising fund. Uh, you're buying a thousand dollar gun or a $5,000 gun or whatever, you'll pitch in an extra five bucks to, uh, you, you have the option at the store to pitch in an extra five bucks or just raise the price of the gun by five bucks. Is there any, uh, as an industry, or is there any kind of discussion about what can be done, something like that, or something to raise the money to raise awareness and contribute to the debate more, uh, more publicly? Sure. Uh, I mean, there's there's been those discussions, and certainly the benefit, of, you know, when we look at the U.S., they've they've got the the if you want to say the tax built into outdoor product lines and how it's controlled, and it's taken at the source. Um, the the idea of doing it in Canada is you know is, is a great idea. The what hasn't been sorted out is who's going to collect it, who's going to pay it, um, who's going to control it, uh, and and so it, it runs into to those areas. When we look at uh, let's say a U.S. model, if we looked at the NSSF in the U.S. and their expanse and strength uh, and the, their efforts, it's it's a little more centralized. Uh, it, when we look in Canada, we have the, the CSAAA certainly doing great work, but we haven't, you know, we haven't unified it in Canada. So do, does a not-for-profit then control it? Um, and, and it hasn't really come onto a table where, you know, do we set up a board of all the stakeholders? And, and is that board five people or 500 people? And, you know, how are decisions made? Who controls it? How is it done? And so that becomes, unfortunately, the obstacle. You know, I've often said, you know, the, the greatest, uh, you know, strategy for uh, the anti-gun or anti-hunting community is to put a bunch of hunters and shooters in a room 
and and let them talk and and they'll end up fighting over everything you know the muzzle loaders don't like the rifle guys the vertical bows don't like the crossbows i mean and we end up doing a lot of infighting that you know we can have our preferences but you know it's like a family at the end of the day when when we get together we need to be a, a you know uh, sort of unified in the, in that sense so to your point uh it's a it's a great idea it's a matter of who's going to control it and 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 how do you manage it how do you get all the players in uh and supporting it you know where one doesn't feel uh you know they're 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 you know putting in the lion's share and then therefore they should have more say and i mean you know it's it's the typical politics that happen uh, within within that kind of group but in principle great idea Another thing that you just mentioned that I want to follow up on is the, the and, and it's really interesting to have your, your point of view as, you know, you've been in your current role for eight years. Before that, you were in charge of hunting education and, uh, and at, a, at a hunting rights, I'll call, it, I'll call it hunting rights organization, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. A lot of gun owners want more prohibitions. I'm referring to the so-called FUDs, the gun owners who think, their gun is somehow exempt or their ownership will somehow be exempt from the next wave of prohibitions and confiscations and exactly the situation you, you described the, the these these this group is thinks only they should have guns the other group should have their guns confiscated what's the way out of that well you know it's 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 so difficult um and you know, we saw it in the 80s with the rallies and, you know, where there was a big push to, to go back. Um, you know, now with this order in council, you know, when they talked about military style assault rifles and such, and then the shotguns, there was some pushback. We know politically to go after what they call the assault rifle was really short and easy pickings for them. I mean, it was... A, a small, as a percentage of, of all gun owners, a small percentage of the gun owners, a small percentage of the guns, the buy pack would be nominal in, in comparison. Um, they can, you know, they can get their taglines about banning guns, making the, making Canada a safer place, um, yet having little impact on, on anything. Uh, so the, the, really the issue, you know, you talk about where's, what's the answer and and it's, it's a change of thinking that, you know, un, unfortunately may take drastic measures. You know, we often, you know, hear about the NRA, if we want to say uh, in the U.S., uh, about never giving an inch. And so, you know, their motto was always around that because they knew what, what we would often say is, well, that's not so bad. You know, that's OK. You know, what could be safe storage? It could be trigger locks. The, the NRA's approach was always never give an inch because then there's never an excuse, right? You're, you're, you never have anybody, you know, sort of upset. Um, but certainly in Canada, we, we unfortunately, we start saying, well, I don't shoot handguns, therefore I'm not worried about them. Or I don't have an assault or, you know, why do you need an assault rifle? E even education within the, our own gun community becomes an issue where, you know, We'll often hear, well, what do you need a 30 round mag for? And it's, you got to remind, you know, even within our own community, well, we don't have 30 round mags, right? It's, a, you know, we, we get inundated, you know, from, from our marketing perspective, it's great that we get inundated with U.S. marketing and uh, because that certainly helps subsidize our own marketing here in Canada. But on, on the reverse to the negative, we get inundated with U.S. politics, U.S. gun laws, you know, the, the old Texas, Florida approach, you know, that doesn't exist in Canada, that all of a sudden we have a, a great group of people thinking that's how it is. Right. And so we we need to educate, certainly, uh, and, and find, you know, uh, uh, that happy place within our own gun community, but certainly within the average person, because, you know, I'm, I'm sure you encounter it. We know when you, when you when you speak to somebody who's not a gun owner, not a hunter, doesn't necessarily come from it, sits on the fence. When you explain our gun laws, our, our regulations, they generally never have a problem. You know, yes, there's a 10 percent or 
way out there on the extreme that, you know, we're, we're never going to convert. We don't care, right? You know, you're just never going to do it. Don't waste your time. Let's gear it to the middle, right? Is, is, and again, we don't necessarily want everybody to be a hunter and everybody to be a, a shooter. We don't have a range, enough ranges now, <laughs> right? But uh, certainly just to appreciate that uh, we are working within, uh, you know, within the law, we are not bad people and we're, we're, we're engaging in an activity that uh, is, is really, you know, productive and, uh, and people are passionate about. Oh. I'm oh. muted again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the, 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 the pitfalls of, uh, of live to tape of recording live. Uh, I'd like to wind down by looking at looking to the future. And I'm just going to put up this chart. This is, uh, I track the import numbers, the Canadian um, firearm import numbers, which to my knowledge are the, the best or the only indicator of the market and the market outlook, the strength of the firearm industry. And it goes, the chart goes back to 1988. These are, stat, these are uh, numbers from Statistics Canada that are available at thegunblog.ca. And when I look at the past few years, we had a peak in 2014, and it's pretty much been downhill since then. This year, there's a little bit of a little bit of an uptick. But is this is the future of the industry? Like, if I were getting into an industry, if I were buying stock in a company in this industry, this is not an industry that I'd want to get into. And my concern is the slow and steady decline of the Canadian firearm ownership community. Is that legitimate? yeah? That yeah, it's an interesting graph. And when we look back at sort of that 14 number, I mean, we see that spike certainly in our own graphs. And uh, uh, when really when looking at the U.S., I mean, that's that's uh, certainly there as well. And, and I, th I think it's safe to say that, you know, we, we can thank Obama for that one. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, well, that's the um, year you joined. That's the year you joined the uh, Beretta. I thought it was you. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And, and so, but really, um, I think from our company perspective, the graph is, is not as, uh, in that kind of decline. Um, you know, we've seen, we're seeing a different, uh, uh, sort of graph, uh, certainly 21 will certainly show a greater number. It could you know, the, the statistics from Statistics Canada are based on, you know, sort of import certificate numbers and that they don't, you know, Canada really doesn't have any good statistics, uh, you know, when it comes to it. So it's a trend, although the numbers are the number that, that's provided. Um, you know, when, when we look at the, you know, the overall trend, um, and if you take it back to 1999, in, in this case, and going forward, then we're seeing a growth. And if you draw a line um, across from one to the other, uh, we're seeing an increase. Uh, there's, there's certainly, uh, could, we could say, a saturation rate at, at some level where there's, uh, you know, a lot of gun owners own a lot of guns. We often see it with handgunners, um, where the peaks and valleys exist there. When there's new guns, you see the spike. Uh, if nothing really new comes in the market, it levels off and starts to decline until the next one because we have a finite number of handgun restricted uh, license holders. And so, so it you know versus let's say a U.S. trend where uh, we saw anti-gun people buying guns you know over the last couple of years, right? <laughs> because they could just walk in and get it with a driver's license and uh, and a quick you know, uh, uh, check, uh, but, but, you know, overall, you know, there, you can be fearful of, you know, guns are all going to disappear and we're going to be out of guns. Not going to happen in our lifetime. Uh, it's the challenges are too great. It's, uh, it's very, there's too much passion attached to it. You know, it's, it's one thing when you're selling nuts and bolts, if you, you know, um, you know, when we're talking about, you know, firearms, it's about passion. It's, it's about, uh, you know, uh, a love for the outdoors. It's a love for recreation. It's, you know, whether it's a game meet, uh, whether it's sustenance in some cases, but at the end of the day, you know, firearms equate to passion. And while there's always passion, there's always a drive to, to, to be involved, to keep buying, just to, to keep using and really participating in, in what we all really love, uh, 
and and that's 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 where you go you know you can you can invest in a graph and and in static items but when you invest in passion i think you're always going to win I'm I'm uh, inspired by by uh, hearing you say that. So thank you for having said that. Um, how does 2022 look for you? 2022 looks exciting, <laughs> you know, to say the least. We, um, you know, uh, right now our response from our our our, our dealer partners uh, has been, you know, over the top and hasn't slowed. Uh, there's the, the demand and flow through has been certainly great in 21 and they see that continuing into 2022. We, we don't know what the end of 2022 will hold, but certainly the beginning of 2022 hasn't stopped and will continue. Uh, the U S trend, uh, speaking with my counterparts in the U S, uh, they're predicting great numbers as well. Uh, you know, the challenge for, Certainly some of our competitors out there in Canada, where a lot of their product comes in from the U.S., always leaves them at odds. If the U.S. is booming, it means Canada is shortchanged. You know, we've been always fortunate where our product comes from our factories, which are primarily in Europe. Uh, and so, therefore, our supply chain is always strong uh, outside of the, the logistical challenges that we've all encountered, but our supply chain is strong and we'll continue to see it. Uh, and so uh, we look at 2022, we've made huge commitments to our factory who've allocated production capacity for us in Canada, and we expect to see continued flow uh, into Canada and, and to, to help service our dealers, but ultimately our end user, consumer, you know, the hunter, the, the, the shooter, uh, and, and just general gun enthusiast out there. So yeah. again, again, I'm encouraged <laughs> to hear that, and I wish you every every possible success. I also want to ask you: um, you have traveled around the world, you've hunted around the world, you have been in charge of this operation for almost eight years. You've done a lot of other stuff, but how has this job and this role and visiting factories, the thing you said at the very beginning, visiting the most modern uh, to the most ancient factories and workshops, how has all of this? shaped your thinking and 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 how you are well it's 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 really been something and and you know putting you know you putting it in, in those terms uh just reminds me of how blessed i am that uh, i've been able to to travel the world see what i've seen do what i've done uh and it's it's really something to be able to go into a factory or part of a factory and see the the handwork, you know, the, the way they've done it for 100, 200, 300, 400 years uh, and and seeing it done the same way and then visit a diff different part of the factory or a different uh, factory altogether and certainly see the automation and the robotics and, and uh, you know, as I say, we, you know, Beretta, uh, in Italy, uses the same robots that Ferrari uses, right? Uh, you know, so it's it's really it's something to see uh, those efforts and those those differences and the detail. And you know, it's it's at the end of the day, it's never a sacrifice of quality uh, in the production side. It's always an improvement on it. But there's just certain things that, you know, when, you know, by hand, when it's done, you know, selection of wood, uh, you know, how they, when they're picking grades of wood and, and how somebody, you know, walks, walks around looking at lumber and starts, starts grading wood, uh, you know, to, to, uh, you know, even when we're in Saco, you know, is a, is a, is a great, for instance, where they have so much robotics there, um, yet they have so much hands on there and uh, two things that stand out is one is for the barrels, uh, when the barrels are made, before they're attached to a gun, they're, they're inspected by eye because they've yet to find a laser or robot that can check the interior of a barrel uh, the same way and with the same efficiency as a human eye because the human eye, the way it could judge the light, how, you know, what, what's going on through that barrel. So they check that barrel against light 
before before that barrel moves on uh, in in the assembly, and also uh, shooting. Um, you know, when we talk about the Sako and Tika accuracy, uh, one of the, the the great things that whenever I bring somebody on a tour there and and they see it because uh, the you know, fortunately, our, uh, in Europe, all guns are proof tested uh, with CIP. Uh, our factories are big enough where the government has their proof house in the factory. But, uh, you know, for uh, Sako and Tika, every gun is, is shot by a human to test for accuracy. And it's not in a fixture. And this is the, the amazing thing is, you know, we've heard that every gun gets shot for accuracy and it must shoot you know, uh, basically a minute or less, uh, uh, or it doesn't move on uh, and doesn't get put out for sale. Um, and it, and everybody's like, well, why wouldn't you do it on a fixture? And, and the Sako's uh, feeling is if you put it on a fixture, you're testing the fixture. If a human puts it on a bag and puts it on his shoulder and pulls the trigger, now you're testing the gun. And, and there's guys, and that's all they do is all day is they shoot every gun, you know. And it's now it, it comes up on a computer screen. It's logged uh, by serial number and, and, uh, and, and, and checked before it can move forward. And that's why, you know, we're always so confident in, in the, the Sakotika performance. But that, that's an example of both robotics and equipment and and the handheld uh and and the that expertise but it's it's really it's it's something to see in, in all our factories uh because all of them have that special place you know from one extreme to the other and it's also really interesting you see everything from the 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 most ancient type of human engineering to the most modern it's it's uh oh yeah absolutely yeah it's it's something it's something and that's and that that becomes a real part of the culture to what makes the product great and what makes us the factory and certainly us uh, as part of it uh, so proud of all our products you know it's uh, it's important and even you know if you saw some modern pictures uh, of even the Beretta factory they have plants and green spaces all throughout the factory uh, trees inside the factory uh, you know displays and chairs and you know, they have so many delegations go through that there's always, you know, the, the spots there. Are, I mean, the, the detail there is, is always visible to all the employees, all the visitors. Um, but certainly that that feeling of you're not just in a factory, you know, you're you're you know, you're you're in a place that builds dreams. <laughs> I, and I, I wish hearing you say that I just wish that the politicians at least and policymakers who are in charge of firearm policy would realize that that they like to talk about guns but behind those guns on every aspect are the people who make them who use them who transport them whose careers depend on them whose livelihoods whose passion you talked about passion that behind all of that hardware are people 100 percent. Yeah. yeah well said well said uh, Spiros Christo, Christo, who thank you very much for being my guest and, and walking me through the, the business and the market and the products of uh, Stoger Canada, part of the Beretta Holding Group. I really hope that I can invite you back. Hey, I'd love to come back. Uh, thanks for everything and thanks for having me. And thank you very much to the viewers of thegunblog.ca. You can find more on the website. Thank you very much.